All right, moving right along, we have a maternal health panel with Dr. Brittany Chambers and Daphina Melbourne. Dr. Brittany Chambers is an Oakland native and assistant professor in the Department of Human Ecology at the University of California at Davis. Dr. Chambers has a PhD education from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Her scholarly work focuses on advocating reproductive and birth equity in Black maternal health through a community partnered approach. Daphina Melbourne is the Perinatal and Reproductive Equity Coordinator for Alameda County's Maternal, Paternal, Child, and Adolescent Health Department. Daphina has received her bachelor's in ethnic studies and her master's in public policy from Mills College of Oakland, California, and has worked in reproductive justice for 16 years. In previous positions, Daphina has worked with the Black Infant Health Program of San Francisco as a family health advocate working with the director and her team to develop additional pieces of training that supported the family during pregnancy. Her expertise lies in developing culturally appropriate, innovative ways to engage Black, Indigenous, and people of color around represent, uh, reproductive justice, that is, access and advocacy from youth to birthing people of advanced age. Her passion is the reproductive freedom of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. You know, that's always my favorite part, just to list all of the wonderful work and the accomplishments of our guests. Thank you ladies for being with us today. You look amazing, Dr. Chambers. You got the, the sunlight, you know, gently caressing the face. You got the beautiful smile, <laughs> Dafina, beautiful smile. Um, but make no mistake, we're, we're, we're here to have uh, a deep discussion and uh, do some work. Before we even jump into the, you know, uh, conversation questions we have, did either one of you want to jump in uh, with anything before we get started? Go ahead, Dr. Chambers. I just want to say I'm excited to be in community right. with Mike's everyone. On. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I had the pleasure mm -hmm. of working with uh, Dafina um, mm -hmm. and a lot of people who have been on this call. So really, really excited to see and hear about the work that's being done um, in Alameda County and happy to contribute um, to this session. Likewise, I'm excited to be here and mm -hmm. thank you, California. All right, well, you know, just jump in and have some of our conversation questions here. Okay. All right. So I think there's a little bit of sound delay for me. So please bear with me. Um, but I'm just going to jump in with the questions here. Uh, what are the most prevalent maternal health disparities in Alameda County? I would say for Alameda County, our most prevalent health disparities are a preterm birth, having infants born at a low birth weight. Um, we have a high cesarean rate, although there are efforts to address that. Um, and we have a lot of maternal morbidity that happens mm -hmm. in the Black community. Yeah, I'd also like to add uh, to, um, okay. that we do see large disparities as well in infant mortality, okay. where uh, Black infants born to Black women and birthing people are three times more likely to die before their first birthday in comparison um, to infants born to white women and birthing people. And then this alarming number that we see overall, right, for California and the nation, this large disparity gap between uh, maternal mortality among Black women as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and are there any structural and systemic conditions unique to Alameda County? Um, no, I wouldn't say they're unique to Alameda County. I think it's a, a national problem. I think the the devaluing and dehumanization that Black women and birthing people experience happens across the board and across the nation. I will say in Alameda County, we do have a large birth worker population, Black birth worker population, people of color birth workers 
who are culturally responsive to the needs of our Black birthing women and, and birthing people population. However, being in a uh, what's considered a blue state and in the Bay Area bubble does not protect us from experiencing obstetric racism and harm um, in all aspects of our reproductive lives. It, it varies depending on what part of California you live in. I know in Alameda County, again, we're very fortunate to have a lot of great programs, a lot of great doctors, a lot of Black birth workers and um, Black clinicians that support this work. However, even given all of that, we still experience a disparate outcome when compared to our other counterparts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would like to add, I agree with what Dafina said in that, you know, it doesn't matter where you live that uh, Black women and birthing people are impacted by structural racism, by racism. Um, also to put into the space too, like a lot of my work um, that I do is kind of like really talking with Black women and birthing people um, across different geographies within California. And we do know that sometimes you know, well, not sometimes, most times racism looks kind of different in um, different spaces and places. And I can say from my experience um, growing up and living like, you know, in Oakland, um, and I feel like Dr. Kim talked about it, like going out into different spaces, like people would think that, you know, Black women and people in California live in, you know, some people say California is, is its own country in comparison to laws and other places. Um, and so I think that we're overlooked often and people mm -hmm. make the assumption um, that, you know, we do not experience racism. Um, I do want to bring in voices uh, from Black women and birthing people that I've had the pleasure of interviewing um, and just show the power of um, centering in um, on voices of community as we're doing this work. And I just want to read a definition uh, from Black women and birthing people from a postpartum group in Oakland. And they define structural racism as a silent opportunity killer that regulates access to resources, better education, and safe neighborhoods for a particular race. And so these are Black women who live in Oakland, right? And it's a silent opportunity killer. Um, and that just really stuck with me because I'm like, yo, this definition is better than any definition I've read, right, in a research article. And then two, just to think about what that means um, for Black women and birthing people um, as they are navigating, you know, throughout their reproductive time period, how it is a silent opportunity killer that um, silence opportunities as they navigate healthcare spaces, educational spaces, um, social services um, in their day-to-day -day lives. Hmm. Okay. Um, and so now when we say the word stress, the stress, the word, you know, it's a big, broad word, but can you address stress and preterm labor to pregnancy outcomes? This is a, a audience question we have here. So stress can, can, can be a number of factors, right? So we have what you would consider um, you know, the stress of not being able to meet your economic needs, the stress of housing insecurity, the stress of food um, insecurity. And I heard a really good term we, we like to call uh, uh, places and locations that don't have access to uh, fruits and vegetables and, and healthy food as food deserts. And I, I heard someone actually call it a food apartheid. It's not a desert. The means and opportunity mm -hmm. to feed people and give people dignity in where they shop mm -hmm. and how they feed their families is actually structurally designed to make sure that our communities do not have access. And there's no real thought and intention around making sure that the foods that we do have access to in our communities are culturally relevant and congruent and that we are being um, provided with what we need. And all of those things are stressful. And that's just on the individual. And when you look at 
at a family and a pregnant person trying to take care of their family, you, we're talking about the stress around having adequate safe child care, the stress of having an educational opportunity for your children, the stress of having to work in an environment that does not see you or hear you. All of those things weather on the Black body. And as you're moving through life, you don't understand that even if you're not conceiving, even if you're not deciding to have a baby, in that moment, all of those experiences are weathering on your body. So when you do decide to conceive, you have that stress. And then you pile on the fact that now you have, um, you have a fetus in utero. And you're trying to figure out all these things. And life doesn't stop because you're pregnant. And you're, you may be working in an environment where now your infant has been born and probably un, un, unintentionally born early because you were stressed out about making rent. You were stressed out. And I think what we don't really realize with the advent of social media is that when something happens to someone who looks like you, looks like your child, looks like your father, your brother, your sister, your cousin, that doesn't just, it's not something that we just watch and consume and can move from. That sits on us, it weighs on us. It weighs heavy on us as, as pregnant women and birthing people. Is my child gonna have an opportunity to thrive and grow? Is my child going, when I bring this child into the world, do I have to consistently worry about their safety, their comings and goings. I have to teach them how to engage with authority so that they're not further harmed. All of these things are things that Black women and birthing people have to consider just after they conceive or are thinking about conceiving. That stress, although not we're not able to measure, has an impact on what's going on in your body. And I know Dr. Chambers had a really beautiful study that she piloted through PTBI that tried to look at that stress, but also looked at our resiliency because it's not always about stress. We have joy in our pregnancies. We are excited to bring more human beings into the world to expand our families. And I think sometimes when we talk about maternal health and maternal mortality, infant mortality, morbidity, we tend to focus on the, the disparate outcomes and the sadness and the trauma, but we have joyful lives and we need to look at both of those things and how we can maneuver through spaces, even with all the trauma that we see, even with all the things that we know are happening to our community, be able to look at our Black joy and thrive in that joy and have spaces created for us where we can be joyful in our pregnancies so that when we do have questions and concerns about what's happening in our bodies, what's happening with our health while we're pregnant, we're being met with dignity and we're, we're being met with empathy and humanity and we're having those questions answered in an authentic way that honors us as individual people with bodily autonomy that is not a monolith, but a part of a, a great group of people who have survived the trauma of enslavement and all of the things that have followed as a result of our ancestors mm -hmm. being stolen and brought here. Dr. Chambers, did you want to jump in with anything else? Yeah, I agree. I absolutely like support and wholeheartedly agree with everything um, that Fina has um, brought up. And I also want to talk about too, I feel like everyone, every panel previously kind of have talked about this, but also, right, the mental health, the cancer, all of these things are things that um, Black women and birthing people also um, struggle with and challenge, uh, have challenges with across their pregnancies. And as Afina mentioned, preterm birth um, rates were also really, really high and disparate among uh, Black women and birthing people before the pandemic. Um, and some uh, qualitative work that I've done um, with Black birthing people during the pandemic, we see that now, you know, there's this additional layer of stress um, with COVID and that we have seen an increase um, in, you know, preterm birth rates. And that is something that that people continue to struggle with. Um, and also, I really wanna uplift what Davina said around through all of this, right? We're still a resilient group of people and we are now introducing how do we heal while doing this work, right? How do me and Davina heal while doing this work? Being 
people who are part of the community. Uh, so we experience it ourselves. We experience it with our sisters, our friends, um, our, our parents, and we're actually out in the community during the work. And so how do we also think about our resilience in this space? How do we think about you know, our collective work also want to uplift the work that Roots does in, in this approach and, and how they um, do this particular work. Um, and just knowing that, yes, uh, when we think about stress, when we think about a chronic stressor, stress. that racism um, is a driving factor in that. And we also still, you know, experience, you know, postpartum depression. We also still experience, you know, um, other stressors such as economic stress, such as anxiety, you know, all of these things collectively um, and one thing that just really, really stuck with me from um, the data that I've collected during the pandemic um, that Tina talked about is that, you know, Black women and birthing people talked about this additional stress, particularly um, birthing um, a Black, Black son or being pregnant with a Black son after um, the George Floyd um, massacre that we've all witnessed and just saying, like, it's this additional stress, you know, yeah. I'm worrying about you know, my Black husband, and then now, like, having this Black son, and I just remember one of the participants saying that they were praying that they were not having a son, right, just praying, like, please, 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 I don't want this burden, uh, but really, you know, no. they're, they talk about their innocence, it's taken away from them so young, because you have to have these early conversations around how you should, you know, navigate through life so that you can make it home to me. Right. And so having these conversations at like nine years old. Um, and so it was something that, you know, was challenging to, to listen to, to analyze this data, to put forth recommendations, um, knowing that these are things that, you know, my sisters are, are struggling with um, during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you both ladies for um addressing so many layers to this you know I when I started I said I know how big of a word stress is how broad of a term it is so you know your comments have really kind of opened our eyes to um how when you say the word stress it's you unraveling so many things when it comes to where is it coming from you know and how I address this so there's so so many things um, another audience question, what work is being done in Alameda County to ensure Black women and birthing people have the resources needed for a healthy pregnancy? And how can we uplift all the community-centered work? So there are some great things happening in Alameda right, right now, and I'm super excited to be able to share this with everyone on the call. So um, as you can see in my background, I have a Deliver Birth Justice in Racism Birth Justice logo, um, and that is a campaign that was launched um, across mm -hmm. five counties um, in, in the Bay Area. We came together to create this campaign to, again, highlight those stories of Black birthing people um, and all of their experiences, but also their joy. We also have an amazing group prenatal care program that is run through Alameda Health Systems in partnership with Alameda County Public Health Department called Beloved Black Birth Centering. The midwives who um, administer this uh, group prenatal care are Black the nurses who supported our Black, the lactation consultants who are showing up are Black, the doulas who are supporting the birthing people are Black. We just had a training last weekend to train six additional Black birthing people who went through beloved Black birth centering who will now go back and support their, um, their colleagues in reproductive lives who are moving through beloved birth. So we're doing that as well. Um, and so there's also great organizations like Black Women Birthing Justice, who is consistently doing research and supporting um, getting the, the information and narrative out around the things that Black women and birthing people need to not only survive their pregnancies, but thrive in their pregnancies. There's another organization called Mothers to Mothers who goes out during the postpartum journey and makes sure that Black pregnant people 
um, in their postpartum work, have all the supplies they need, because as we know, those supplies when you give birth are very expensive, um, making sure they have that, but also making sure that they have six weeks of meals to make, you know, when you're tired, when you're, the first six weeks is a fog, you're exhausted, you're getting to know your baby, your baby's getting to know you, you really don't have the, the mental bandwidth to worry about what are we going to eat tonight, like that, that can seem like a daunting task. Um, and so we make sure, sure. that um, that they have six weeks worth, worth of postpartum meals. There's also two great lactation consultants from Oakland that I want to lift up. One is Tonifer Kamara, who has TLC Consulting, and she's a, a wonderful IBCLC and researcher who works uh, intently with Beloved Black Birth, but there's also Brandy Gates Burgess that has breast friends Brand. who saw a need in West Oakland for Black um, and uh, women of other women of color who were breastfeeding, chest feeding, who needed a community and said, you know what, you need a breast friend. Um, and so created this support group where they could come together because we find that in our community, unfortunately, because of the legacy of enslavement, because of the legacy of us always having to work, um, whether it be by choice or by need, that our instances of exclusively breastfeeding um, are not where they need to be. And oftentimes our families, because of them not really knowing the benefits of breast and body feeding, they discourage us from doing it. And so while they think it is helpful to just give that baby a bottle um you don't need to do that that baby's too big now you need to take that baby off the breast all of those things can be detrimental <laughs> to our breast chest feeding journey and so having someone there who looks like you relates to you um who can tell you the real about breast chest feeding is so important we need our care team to be reflected back in us in our culture. We need people to understand how we eat, how we talk, how we move about the world so that things that are culturally specific to us are not misunderstood by a provider. And then having that misunderstanding be weaponized by bringing in someone like a social worker or CPS when it's not needed, because you just didn't understand. For instance, um, there's something going around right now where this nurse came and checked in for her shift. And this other nurse who took care of a black pregnant person said she called for a psych eval because this black woman was patting her head now we all know when you see somebody doing this we know what's going on your your scalp itches she, oh. instead of asking this person what's going on why are you doing this she thought this person was self-harming and called a psych eval we know how that that snowball would, mm. could have had her child taken away from her when the black nurse heard what was going on she said was she doing this oh she was scratching her head. There's nothing wrong with her. I'm going to take that psych eval request out. That is, a, that is what cultural representation looks like in healthcare. Understanding our mannerisms and what we do and how we speak is so important for us to have reflected back at us. And I think in Alameda County, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to model. That's what we're trying to provide to our Black pregnant people so that they know when you come in and you have a need and concern in Alameda County, we're going to sit with you. We're going to talk to you. We're going to try and figure out how to support you through this journey in the way that most appropriately fits with your needs and your need to do. But walking that journey with you so that you're making the best decision for yourself based on your life, your lived experience, and what you want your outcomes to be, and not what we think your outcomes should be. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Chambers? I just have two people who I want to add in that, um, the work of Aisha Mays with the Dream Clinic, um, at um, Roots Community Health Care um, Center. And then also, I want to give Mrs. Dafina Milborn her flowers as well in the, in the role um, that she has in Alameda County as the Perinatal um, Equity Initiatives Coordinator. 
Um, and then also, I feel like something came up earlier today too, as well. All of these programs, right, that are led by amazing powerhouse um, Black people. Um, and I feel like there is this consistent thing around funding, right? It's been brought up, like we're all really committed to the work, uh, whether we're funded or not. Uh, but there are so many amazing things that could be going on, that could be spread throughout um, the county uh, to touch more um, Black mamas and birthing people, um, and that funding continues to be um, an issue, right? An issue, particularly when uh, we're trying to do the work the way that we do it, which is in partnership with community. Um, and so that has been an issue that I've experienced. I know have other people um, have experienced um, getting uh, programs and implementing things that we know our community needs um, in Alameda County. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so again, that was a, a very powerful story about, you know, uh, how cultural things can be misunderstood and have this terrible uh, negative effect. Um, so, you know, when you were telling this story, it's, it's, it's uh, so many other things popped in my head. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit more about some of the stigmas and things that we've heard. I know like, for example, I've heard that, you know, as black women, nobody believes us when we say that. Tolerance for pain that we're just not, you know, we're trying to articulate, okay, something's wrong. We do have the self-awareness, okay, something's wrong. Something's not right. Um, you know, talk a bit more about, you know, these things that you might have seen and heard and how we can, you know, advocate for ourselves and communicate better. Because sometimes if, you know, you know something's wrong, you know, how do we get people to listen? So I'd say that is a great question, right? I honestly, to answer that question, I don't feel like there is anything that we need to do differently as a Black community, right? That we know that uh, racism exists, that providers have biases um, and just want to put in the space that California um, is ahead of the curve again with passing SB 464 um, that does a mandate now for perinatal health perinatal healthcare providers um, to take a racial equity training that's grounded in reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. They have so many things um, that uh, need to be uh, done and required in order for them to kind of work on their biases and hold themselves accountable to provide um, respectful, dignifying care uh, to Black women and birthing people. Um, and I am currently a pilot testing a training that I have developed um, in partnership with Black women and birthing people and uh, providers in the San Francisco Bay area um, to kind of do this, right? right? Because it is a problem. It doesn't matter. You know, we saw, we heard the story from uh, Serena Williams, right? Had the similar experiences that, that we're hearing um, from people in our community, from our sisters. Um, so it doesn't matter right. your income bracket, doesn't matter, you know, all these things the studies have shown, right? It doesn't matter. It's something about our Blackness that is a threat. And it's actually like, historical is rooted within the way providers are uh, taught medicine um, and, you know, healthcare systems weren't designed to protect us. Um, and so knowing that perspective, you know, we're now taking this approach, well, how do we redesign healthcare systems? How do we train providers? How do we take things off, you know, from us, right? Because it's not our fault. You know? <laughs> it's how do we change the system to better support us? Because we're all spending our tax dollars and money um, for these services in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I will also say um, that what needs to be understood is that anti-Blackness lives in every community, even in ours. We have been conditioned not to love ourselves, not to love our hair, to assume the worst out of each other. And other communities have been taught the same. And so when we go into spaces and places where we need care, 
um, oftentimes we we put on a protective layer. We may change how we speak. We may dress a certain way so that when we walk in the space, we, we're seen in a certain light. We, we may, you know, there's all kinds of things that we do to try and buffer the disrespect that we presume is going to happen because it's happened many times. And even if it hasn't happened to us, it's happened to somebody we know. Um, and, and most importantly for our own people, I want our own people to know that how you show up is how you show up. You should not have to change your voice, change your clothes, change your demeanor, your mannerisms, neither should your partner. You should be able to walk in a space and be respected as a human being. So I don't think it's necessarily how we advocate for ourselves because I know that we are very clear on what our needs are, what our pain level is, how we would like to be treated. It is the healthcare system that is not training its providers to see us in our human, in our humanity, not to give us empathy. There are still residents who, who say that they believe that we have a higher pain threshold than others. There is, there's all these tropes about the strong Black woman that people actually believe. We've even believed it for ourselves where we can't be soft, we can't be vulnerable, we can't have needs and concerns. All of that has to be addressed right. in the healthcare system. And I think SB 464 and SB 65 are great starts. What I would like to see now that these bills have been passed and have been implemented is some accountability some real-time accountability when someone and, and accountability to your counterparts. So if you're in a, a case conference with a pregnant person who is in your L and D and, and they're in labor and you're case conferencing with another nurse or another provider, and they say something like, oh, well, this patient is non-compliant. Compliant with who? Compliant with who? They're an adult making the decision for themselves. And if you're recommending something that they don't want to do, it is your job mm -hmm. to work with them to figure out what are their questions and concerns. And even after all of that has been solved for, and they say, I still don't want to do that. Honor that choice. Don't go out and tell your, your colleague, oh, they're non-compliant. Oh, they're, they're, they're resistant because then now they have this idea of this pregnant person that they're going to give care to the next eight or 12 hours. They're going to walk in that room with the idea that, oh, this person is, is obstinate and difficult and is going to be a difficult patient when no, they know what they want. They've advocated for that and they expect you to meet that need. And it's not your job to get angry because they're not listening to you because you know what, they're an adult and they're making a decision and the decision may not be aligned with what you need. But when you do thoughtful work around who you are and how your biases show up and what you were taught growing up and what your grandparents showed you and what society showed you about Black people, and you question that in real time, and you correct yourself in real time, then you can provide respectful care. And I need people to understand if your colleague is harming Black people and you're seeing that, it is your job also to go to your superior and say, I notice things about this nurse when they're dealing with black patients. I think there's a problem. I think there's some questions that need to be had. I think there's some classes that need to be taken mm. and it needs to be documented in their file, not just talked about on the floor. We need these healthcare providers who are showing up in these spaces and being paternalistic and being racist to our people removed from the healthcare system. Just like they make us an example when they, they say, well, all black people, well, then you need to understand that to us, the medical system in and of itself is harmful. And so when we come in and we say, I don't wanna do that, it might be because my grandma did it and she was hurt. My grandma talked about her pain and you didn't listen to her and she died in pain. We carry that with us. And so there's, there's a, there's a, there's a twofer that's a, we can advocate and should advocate for ourselves, but we should also be respected in our humanity. Wonderful. Wonderful. So where can folks get a hold of you to connect and learn more?
I will drop my email in the chat. I have also dropped some articles that I feel like support some of the things that we've been talking about today. Mm -hmm. And I can be reached at uh, Thank our, you. our MPCAH, uh, gov website, but we also have our Deliver Birth Justice campaign website that will link you back to Alameda County. So I'll drop that in the chat as well. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies, for your work and for your passion and, you know, for, um, again, connecting the dots for us and making sure that we are all heard and that we're all healthy. Dr. Brittany Chambers and Dafina Melbourne, thank you so much for being with me.